Hey, what's up, everybody? Today we're going to be talking about the JBL L100 Classic MK2. Okay, uh, these retail for about $4,800 and they were loaned to me by JBL for review, but I was not paid and I don't get to keep these. So uh, just all that up front. Let's quickly talk about the specs and then we're going to get into the review. This is a three way design that features a 12 inch pure pulp cone woofer with cast basket and dual spiders. It features a five and a quarter inch mid range and a one inch titanium dome tweeter with acoustic lens and waveguide. There are tonality adjustments, which they call high frequency and mid frequency attenuators on the front baffle. So you can make adjustments and lower the high frequency and the mid range or boost them if you'd like to. This features a throwback grill, which is the Quadrex foam grill. Sensitivity is spec at 90 decibels. Power handling is spec at 25 to 200 watts. Impedance is 4 ohm, and it is a vented enclosure with a front firing port. These come in three different grill colors, as you see here. Orange, black, and blue. Couple things up front. I know I say this a lot, but I just want to make sure that everybody's on the same page. So I'll be a little bit more quicker, quicker, quickly. All right. Um, when I talk about on axis or off axis aiming, and I talk about positioning the speakers, black indicates on axis zero degrees aiming directly at the listening position. Any angle off of that is toe in or toe out. Red would be toe out by 30 degrees. When I talk about distance from the wall, I'm talking about from the back of the speaker to the wall. With this speaker in its standard mode, so with the tonality adjustment set to their default, their zero dB, um, the mid-range was just, it's too scooped out for my liking. Now, its it wasn't one of those things where it stood out immediately. It's like a lot of other speakers where there can be variations to the response that may not stand out immediately, but when you have a reference speaker to compare it to, like I do right now, then those differences become more noticeable. So for the time being, I'm using a pair of Audio First Fidelia bookshelf speakers. This is a kit design, retail for about maybe 950 US dollars. These measure very linearly, and I'm gonna show you an example of that later, but just so you know, this is my comparison. So normally what I'll do is I'll listen to the speakers in stereo mode, I'll listen before I measure everything, and then I'll measure and then I'll compare my listening notes, and then what I like to do now is to have that reference speaker because it's it's a nice, easy speaker to move around and just compare tonality. So when I was comparing tonality with the speakers side by side directly in front of me, that mid-range dip was more prominent. Uh, the other thing that I noticed was because of that mid-range dip, the bass was a lot more punchy in that 100 hertz region. And then the upper mid-range, around two kilohertz or so, stood out in terms of presence or detail or attack. So with that said, those are the attributes to the speakers that stood out to me for better or worse. Actually, I was really quite fond of that mid bass punch. They get low in room to about 40 Hertz. So there's plenty of bass, but I had seen where my friend Napier Lopez had reviewed these speakers maybe a few years ago. And I saw where he said he actually preferred these speakers with the tonality adjustment set to max. So I did that and I tried that and I actually liked it more that way. What it did was it filled in that mid-range scoop, caused the one to two kilohertz area to not stand out quite as much. And it also elevated the treble enough or filled in the treble enough to where the speaker sounded more linear on axis. Now it did that at the cost of that mid-bass punch around 100 hertz. So if you think of things in terms of relative sound. If you have a scoop in the mid range, then you're going to have a little bit more elevated mid bass and you're going to have a little bit more elevated upper mid range. So when that scoop is kind of taken out via turning the max or via turning the tonality toward the max on the mid range, that mid bass thump is kind of removed and you get a more linear sound. And I actually have the measurements for this as well. And I'll also say that the measurements with the grill on really don't differ much from the measurements with the grill off. And I did listen to these with the grill off for the majority of the time. I put the grill on and listened, but I got to be honest, without doing some quick ABX testing or something, I don't know that I would have really noticed a difference. So just food for thought there. Of the speakers that I've tested recently, I think these have the lowest multi-tone distortion. And they have very good compression values, meaning that they have a lot of 
dynamic range out of these speakers. So this is, in my opinion, kind of the speaker that really lives up to its name or its heritage in terms of thinking that it's a rock and roll speaker, right? I mean, if you've seen the ad, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. And the speaker really does a good job of living up to that. But the tonal adjustments allow you to make the speaker more linear. So you really can fine tune the sound to what you like. So if you do compare it to a speaker that is more neutral, or if you like a speaker that's more neutral, these in their stock form probably aren't going to tickle your fancy. But if you want to really rock out, then that's what these were really designed to do until you adjust that tonality knob. And then that'll make these speakers more linear. And as I said, that was more to my liking. The other con about these speakers is due to their asymmetric design with their offset of drivers, you will have a little bit more trouble, at least in my opinion, setting these up and getting these to sound dialed in in your living space. Now, most speakers, I don't often have a lot of trouble unless they're very narrow in their radiation profile or, yeah, typically that's it, honestly. But when they have an asymmetric design, usually what that means is the sound that goes out to the right of the speaker is going to be different than the sound that goes out to the left of the speaker. And especially if you have a really reflective room, then those reflections are going to be different from side to side. So this speaker is going to take you a little bit more time to set up for your personal subjective taste. Not even just distance from the wall or toe in versus toe out, but even switching the speakers around from side to side. You may want to play around with that a little bit more than you're used to. Now, personally, I found that bringing these speakers out from the wall did them a lot of service. If I pushed them too close to the wall, they were just too boomy because they get down pretty low. So I brought these out about two feet from the wall. And I think that was kind of like a good sweet spot, two feet, 0.66 meters for those of you who like the, uh, the metric units. Ideally, you might even want to bring them out further from the wall, but I think two feet is probably okay if you need to put them a little bit closer to the wall. And remember, they got the front port, so you don't really have to worry about that either. The other thing, as I said earlier, is about aiming. So if they're pointed directly at me, I felt like the upper, well, maybe not the upper treble, because that kind of seems like an oxymoron, doesn't it? Um, the treble itself was just maybe a little bit too elevated. And when I looked at the data, I kind of get a feel for why that is. I towed them out about 30 degrees, which is something else that I noticed that James Larson said in his review. Because after I did all this, I was curious. These two guys that I respect a lot. So I wanted to see what their measurements looked like and what their subjective impressions were and see how, you know, how we line up and see what makes sense and maybe what doesn't for me. And if I can't find anything that makes sense on my end, then I've got to dive a little bit deeper. But with that said, you know, I, I do agree with James Larson that pointing these out into the room for these speakers probably makes more sense for most users. I think if you point them directly at you, you're going to get a little bit too much of that sibilant region. So with that said, let's go ahead and take a look at the data. Now, all of my data is captured using the Clipple Near Field Scanner. It is a state-of-the-art robotic device that allows you to get anechoic data in a non-anechoic environment. And what that really means, if you're not familiar, is anechoic is without echo. The reason that you want measurements without echo or without reflections is because you want to know exactly what the speaker itself is doing. And if you know what the speaker itself is doing before you put it into a room, then you have a better idea of how to set it up, where to aim it, uh, how far to bring it off the wall, and you get a better idea of its overall tonal balance, and you can use that data to compare against other speakers. I mean, the easiest example is just to look at low-frequency extension, right? If you have a speaker that measures that it rolls off around 80 hertz, and then you have another one that rolls off at 50 hertz, and you know that you want a speaker that rolls off lower than the one at 50 hertz, you've got empirical objective data to help you understand that and make the best possible decision for you. And then as we go above the spectrum, that's when things get a little bit more dicey and everybody says measurements don't matter. And it's like, yeah, but they do, right? So you can use this information to help you make an educated guess rather than just a totally blind one. And yeah, I'll leave it there. But the next thing we're going to talk about is the impedance. So the impedance measures at about a nominal, uh, well, minimum is 3.4. I would say that their nominal ranking of 4 ohm makes sense for me. There's no resonances in this data, so the cabinet seems like it's pretty clean and uncolored. Oh, and before I go any further, these measurements are all done without the grill unless stated otherwise, okay? And they're also in their neutral state with the 0 dB tonality adjustments, again, unless stated otherwise. So the on-axis linearity is something that I really like to look at to check manufacturer's claims for sensitivity and its roll-off profilers, base extension. So 
Sensitivity specs at about 89.7 decibels according to my measurements. F3 is at 50 hertz, F10 is at 31 hertz. This is relative to the average sensitivity. So look right here though, you see this bump right there? That's about three dB higher than the average sensitivity. And then you'll see this mid-range dip. And then you've got this peak and this mid-range, upper mid-range, lower treble dip, and this peak around four to six kilohertz or so. These are things that I heard in my listening session. And, I, and listen, I've had recently people say, well, of course you hear magically what the data shows. And it's like, well, this stuff isn't rocket science, really. Uh, if you go and look at the number of producer or engineer based websites, they have all these cheat sheets for if you want the speaker to sound this way, or if you want your mix to sound this way, then EQ this thing. So that's how we learn. I've been doing this for like 15 years. So it's really easy, again, especially when you have a baseline speaker that is a known neutral reference. So I'm going to show you that data for that speaker in a second. But let's look at what happens when you set the max tonality adjustments. And this is what you get. So you get a more linear response, but notice that this mid range now is brought up a little bit more, which makes this mid bass thump area kind of diminished a little bit. Okay. So that's one thing that changes. And then you'll also notice that the treble kind of linearizes out, it flattens out a little bit more too. So this is the profile that I actually preferred. And if you want a more linear speaker, but the ability to get loud and rock out, I would suggest trying this. Of course, you've got a wide range of tonality adjustments that you can try, but don't be afraid to just max this out and see what happens. Normally, I wouldn't suggest something like that. But in this case, I think it's worthwhile. The CEA 2034 data set, we can actually see this speaker has pretty dang good Directivity. I mean, you've got a mild change around here, and I'm assuming this is probably where the 12 inch hands off to the five and a quarter inch mid range. But overall, the directivity on the speaker looks really good, which means that you can equalize the speaker to your taste. Let's say you get it in this bone stock condition. You don't want to mess with those tonality adjustments, but you want to make adjustments to the sound via equalization. You can do that, and the speaker is going to behave very well with that equalization. What about with the grill on? Well, you can see a little bit of a difference in this higher frequency area. So I'm gonna go back to grill off. Okay, and now grill on. Now, grill off, let's see what it looks like with the max tonality. Here you go. It's just an overall more linear response and the directivity still looks good. What about estimated in-room response? In its natural state without any tonality adjustments, this is what you have. And this is basically how I heard the speaker. The biggest difference for me was just this recessed mid-range right there. Now this bass thump is relative to the low mid-range and I stated that earlier, in-room extension is to about 40 hertz. Now what if I set it up with the max tonality? This is what you get. And my note down here is really just calling attention to the differences that you're probably gonna hear and why you're gonna hear them that way. So the max tonality offers a more linear in-room response at the expense, in quotes, of the liveliness. And the liveliness that I'm defining is this mid bass thump, and this two kilohertz or so presence region. So when you bring up in blue the mid range tonality via the knob, what that does is that makes the mid bass stand out less and it makes the upper mid range stand out less. And for what it's worth, this is the speaker that I'm using for my AB reference. The radiation pattern on the speaker was something I forgot to mention earlier. It's nice and wide. It's a really big enveloping sound. I like that. Uh, I'd say it's about plus or minus 70 degrees, but note that there's asymmetry. So it extends a little bit further to one side than it does the other, but it's not a huge difference. Vertical is at about plus or minus 20 degrees, but really you probably want to stay on axis with that tweeter area. Harmonic distortion at 86 decibels and at 96 decibels. Both of these are very, very, very low. Now, what about multi-tone distortion? Also very, very, very low. It's between about 1% and 3% you should have no problem jamming out to the speaker at high volume. And finally, the dynamic range or the instantaneous compression. It's highest at this one point, what is this? 1.7, 1.8 kilohertz. I'm assuming this is probably in the crossover region. I don't have the specs in front of me, but more likely that's what it is. It's high enough Q where I don't know if you're really even going to hear that, but it is worth noting that it does exist. Now, I, with that aside, I still think it's really great performing dynamic range for a speaker. And that does it for this review. Hopefully you've uh, you've got some information that can help you out, make a better informed purchase decision. Or if you already own these, maybe now you even feel even better about them, or you've got some ideas you can try to make the sound a little bit better in your listening space. 
Uh, if you appreciate what I'm doing here and you like what I'm doing here, there's one of two ways to help contribute to uh, this channel and allow me to keep doing what I'm doing here and keep the lights on, so to speak. One is to join me at patreon.com slash Aaron's Audio Corner, where I provide not secret information, but behind the scenes information, some things that I don't share publicly and, and things of that nature. And it's just a way to help me out while also getting some additional stuff that I don't post publicly. Uh, the other way would be to join, not join, use any of my generic affiliate links through Amazon, Crutchfield, Best Buy, or whatever. I'll have them in the description section below. And if you just click on that link and you go buy whatever, we're coming up on Christmas time, you're probably gonna be aligned on buying a lot of stuff. Eh, you know, maybe think of me, click that link, buy whatever it is that you need to buy. That earns me a small commission, at no additional cost to you. And it's, it's really, really appreciated. Yeah. So I will talk to y'all later. Take care.